ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ನಮಸ್ತೆ so what is the final exam of life huh? what determines whether our life is a failure or a success death the experience of death will test everything whether we have let go of our attachments whether we have cultivated a real spiritual awareness whether we have a particular destination that we can go to or whether we just throw ourselves on the mercy of of yama the god of death huh these are all big issues concerning death that actually death is the gateway to the next life it is a very important moment the most important moment of one's life krishna says in bhagavad gita yam yam vapi smaran bhavam tyajatante kalevaram tam tam evaiti kaunteya sada tad bhava bhavita that whatever you think of at the time of death that state of being you will attain without fail in the next life so what do we think of at the time of death i've explained several times on this channel that the mind at the time of death is being compressed all of the impressions all of the thoughts all of the desires all the memories everything there in the mind our feelings are are all my mental condition is being compressed into a seed you know like when you make a backup of your computer and all the files get compressed into some medium like a backup drive or the cloud or whatever and then they go on their merry way and this seed becomes the seed of the next life so what do we think of at the time of death all the habitual and recurring thoughts and themes of our mental activity during our entire life so what does this mean that means if we live a life of extraversion and sensual excess and desire and greed and attachment and projection like so many people do that at the end of life these things will go into the seed and our next life will be more or less the same as this one now if that's what you want i guess that's okay <laughs> although it does involve a lot of suffering the vedanta sutra the third book of the vedanta sutra the third adhyaya discusses the two paths that people go on after death the path of the moon and the path of the sun those who go on the path of the moon stay inside the earth moon system yes they can enjoy a kind of heaven on the moon which is like a release from earthly life for a certain amount of time but then they have to come back again and they may have to visit hell on the way so this is what happens after death a person who is like an ordinary mundane human being goes to the moon planet where they're in their subtle bodies now remember there are five bodies the anamaya kosha the manomaya kosha sorry the pranamaya kosha then the manomaya kosha the vijnana maya kosha and finally the ananda maya kosha five bodies so when we die huh 
All we do is lose the gross body, the anamaya kosha, the food sheath. The other four bodies are still integrated and they go either to the moon or on the path of the sun. So the people who go to the moon experience some relief in the interlife state. It's like purgatory, you know? It's not really heaven, it's just the absence of suffering for a little while. Like dreams, it's like a dream. And then they have to experience their bad karma of the, the bad actions they did in this life, and then they get a new body according to their just deserts. So this is the cycle of birth and death, samsara, over and over and over again. But someone who goes on the path of the sun is someone who has satisfied the higher authorities by service and offerings and study and chanting of mantras and so many other things in this life. That person goes to the sun planet, and from the sun planet, they can go to pretty much any place they want. This is the path of the yogis, not the stupid people down at the mall in the exercise class, huh? <laughs> the real yogis, the yogis who find their ishta devata, their worshipable deity, and spend the majority of their life worshiping that deity, then at the end of life, their accumulated impressions, of course, invoke that deity. And then they go via subtle channels to the sun and then to the planet of their Ishta Devata. So in other words, interplanetary travel is not done by spaceships or, you know, gateways or portals or whatever you want to call it. Interplanetary travel is done by shedding the gross body on this planet and then going in the subtle body according to the power of mantras that one has chanted in this life to another planet and taking birth there in the realm of that deity. That's how it's done. So one can go to oh, a wide assortment. There are 32 million demigods and each one has their own realm. And so if you worship any one of them successfully, you go to their realm. But we want to know then, what is the best? What is the highest? Well, a lot of it has to do with taste, you know? Like most kids really don't like green vegetables for some reason, probably because they're overcooked and underspiced. <laughs> but green vegetables are necessary for nutrition right so if someone neglects eating their vegetables their whole life just because of some stupid childish idea then they neglect their nutrition in that area and they fall prey to disease because of that deficiency but someone who eats their vegetables as a discipline knowing that it's good nutrition whether they like it or not first of all eventually develops a taste for them and then you can't convince them that green vegetables are bad because they know their own experience that they're good. So in the same way, a person becomes used to worshiping a certain deity, a certain God, like Ganapati or Lakshmi or Vishnu or you know any of the many, many, many gods that there are. And so because of that taste, they go to that God's realm after death, if they're successful, if they haven't been sinful, uh, if they haven't developed attachment for this world, then they go to the moon. But if they go to the sun, then they can go to whatever planet they want. So in this way, the yogis go to the higher planets and in those planets, they either enjoy heavenly pleasures, like real heavenly pleasures, they live like gods, or they can find a guru there and continue to progress spiritually until they reach final enlightenment. Now, this is a very interesting topic because certainly there can be mixed cases. 
Because in the heavenly planets, in the planets of the demigods, there's no scarcity. There's no lack. There's no competition for resources. Everybody has everything they need. And their bodies are basically immortal because they're made of mind stuff, energy, energy and information. So in this way, they can exist, you know, for the whole duration of the universe, if they like. And so there's plenty of time and plenty of scope because there's unlimited Vedic knowledge there. For example, the uh, edition of Mahabharata scripture that's in the planets of the demigods is supposed to be 10 times the size of the Mahabharata that we have on this planet. And this, similar with other Vedic scriptures. So the Vedic scriptures there are more voluminous, more complete, and also higher. Because there, there's no shortage of enlightened gurus. So this should be our aim. And we should start the worship of the higher deities early in life so that we accumulate as many impressions of that puja, of that bhakti, as possible in this life to set us up for going to that planet, going to that realm in the next life. This is the whole strategy of sadhana and puja and self-development given by the actual authentic yoga process. Huh? So one should not simply be motivated by selfishness that, oh, if I do this puja, then my life will be more, uh, I'll have more wealth, I'll have a better position, more power. You know, if I go to this holy man and, and worship him, maybe he give me a blessing and I can have more children or a better wife or, you know, higher pay or something like that. This is all very mundane. These are the people who go to the moon planet, even though they're externally pious, you know, they still have, because they're primarily selfishly oriented, then they have to take birth again, because as we talked about last time, the I, the ego is the effort that we put into being or becoming who and what we are. But if one can transcend this through bhakti, through spiritual love, and begin to motivate all their activities by a desire to serve others, beginning with their chosen deity, their Ishta Devata, then the actions and efforts of sadhana do not create any false ego because they're not doing it for themselves. They're not doing it for I, me, mine. They're doing it out of love for God or goddess. And they're doing it out of duty because these are the instructions in the scriptures. So this should be our platform. And when we get to the end of life, you know, near the end of life, then our main concern should be, what is the state of consciousness in which I am going to leave my body? What is the state of being that I can attain that will carry me to the next life in the place where I want to go? So one should then meditate on the highest state of consciousness that is available, that is reachable, not by effort, because remember that creates ego, but by love, by attraction, by the power of beauty. The mind is attracted by beauty more than anything else. So one should see the higher states of consciousness, the non-dual consciousness within, as the highest state of being. And one should be spontaneously attracted to that. Huh? This is Ananya Bhakti. In Ananya Bhakti, one is naturally attracted to worshiping the self. And what is worship really? It's giving our attention. When we give our attention to something, that creates impressions of that thing within the mind. And over time, that 
creates our destiny, our destination in the next life. So one should fill the mind with impressions of the highest state of consciousness, the self, the origin of everything, the non-dual awareness without an object except itself, because that is the highest destination after which one does not take birth again on any planet. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.